Okay, so I, I shall go ahead. Greetings to all our colleagues, friends, and fellow blue economy enthusiasts from all over the world. I would like to officially welcome you to the first event hosted by the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College Innovation Hub. It is also the first collaboration between the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College Innovation Hub and our wonderful partners at UNDP Accelerator Lab in Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. We are happy that you are part of this great initiative designed to spark your imagination, encourage more blue entrepreneurship, drive the creation of indigenous blue technologies, and most importantly, protect our planet and ocean resources. At this point, I would like to hand you over to our wonderful moderator, Head of Solutions at UNDP Accelerator Lab, Mrs. Jordana Tenenbaum, who will introduce her unit and the key presenter. Take it away, Jordana. <laughs> Thank you, Brent, and good morning, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, please let me know if you can see it, and I'm going to go full screen. Can you hear me well, and can you see the screen well? Yes? Okay, excellent. All right, so good morning, everyone, or at least good morning um, from Barbados. Um, it's really great to be here today as a part of the Blue Skills 4.0 workshop series um, as we aim to prepare for the future of work in the Caribbean blue economy. Um, as Brent mentioned, my name is Jordana Tenenbaum, and I am the United Nations Development Program Head of Solutions Mapping at the Accelerator Lab, um, which is based in Barbados, but we cover the entire Eastern Caribbean. So to provide a very quick introduction to the Accelerator Lab and how we focus on the blue economy in the Caribbean, um, I'll provide today a very brief overview of the global UNDP Accelerator Lab program, which we are a part of, um, as well as a bit about our particular Accelerator Lab, which is based in Barbados. So the Global Accelerator Lab Network was founded in 2019, and it now includes 91 labs that cover 116 countries throughout the world. Um, and we were lucky enough to have Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean be selected as one of those labs. We're a part of this giant network. Um, overall, the labs are tasked with accelerating learning and development by testing new solutions to challenges such as on plastic pollution, uh, gender inequality, and poverty, just to provide some examples. And to do so, the labs aim to try out novel approaches, such as applying new forms of data um, to those particular challenges to see both what works and what doesn't work in a very experimental fashion. Um, and then additionally, the labs are constantly scanning the horizon to identify emerging trends and opportunities that are arising throughout the world. So as mentioned, there are 91 labs in operation throughout the world, including in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And within this network, there's a large focus on small island developing states with 11 labs operating in island states and regions, as you can see here on the right hand side. Um, and this really allows us to draw on unique insights and learnings from other labs that are working in similar contexts to the Caribbean, um, such as in the Pacific, in Samoa, and, in, and more closer to Barbados in Trinidad and Tobago, which are one of our, our key partners. So there are, are, there are a variety of principles that the Accelerator Lab adheres to, um, but in the interest of time for today, since I'm going to keep this brief, I'm just going to highlight a few of them. Um, one is to accelerate what already exists. So this means looking at innovative small scale solutions that are occurring on the ground and helping them grow through either partnership generation, uh, access to capital or technical expertise. And through this point, we're not necessarily coming up with new concepts, but are rather focusing on what already exists and what's already starting to work. And then as well, we also aim to learn by experimenting and testing ideas. And from there, we share those insights gathered with our global learning network. And then lastly, we really aim to empower local innovators as opposed to extracting knowledge from them. So within this global lab network, we're constantly connecting the dots between one another as each lab works on testing and piloting innovative grassroots solutions to challenges, such as on climate change and governance. And those interactions then generally feed into larger scale learning surrounding development problems in order to rapidly accelerate change. That's one of our, our core missions. 
So in our focus on accelerating change within the context of development challenges, each lab applies this distinctive learning cycle, as we call it, um, which moves from sensing to exploring to testing, and then lastly, to growing. So I'm not going to get into all these steps today, um, but I would like to share that this collaboration with SALCC is a really great example of growing for us, um, because through this collaboration, we're scaling out learnings from our BlueBot project, which we'll get into today, um, on AI, on machine learning, and on other topics in the Caribbean blue economy, um, which will be covered uh, shortly by Antonio Hollingsworth. So to provide a, a very brief holistic snapshot or an overarching picture of what all the labs are working on throughout the world, um, this SDG wheel breakdown demonstrates how vast and varied the network is. Um, however, it does concentrate in areas such as cities, employment and responsible production and consumption, which we often hear quite a lot about throughout the network. So to wrap up for today, I'll close with just a bit on our particular accelerator lab and its functions. Um, to introduce myself and our team further, our lab is made of three key roles, including myself as head of solutions mapping. Um, we have Nicholas Simpson as head of exploration and Kevin Simmons as head of experimentation. Um, and they'll probably pop in and out of our, our three part workshop series. Uh, to touch on my role very briefly, my job is to identify local solutions from local innovators who are developing unique solves to challenges in the blue economy at the grassroots level. And then as well within the blue economy, um, our accelerator lab focuses on some key areas of experimentation that I wanted to highlight. And this includes in fisheries, waste management, sustainable tourism, and renewable energy. And because the blue economy is so vast and so emerging, uh, this allows us to concentrate on some key themes and idea areas. As well, since we have been operational since 2019, um, we have also completed a variety of different tests and experiments in collaboration with grassroots innovators. Um, and this has included our underwater coral reef mapping and monitoring experiment using robotics, which will be the focus of today. Um, and as well, for example, a non-food bioplastic packaging alternative that we supported, um, which is made with sargasm seaweed extracts and starch extracts. And then moving ahead into 2022 and what we're working on now as well, um, our lab will be focusing on its new blue digital experiment, as we call it, which is an app and a web-based platform that is currently based in Barbados um, that will apply digital tools and solutions in order to improve various segments of the blue economy ecosystem and its value chains. Um, and this includes for fisher folk, government, tourism industry partners, and the general public as consumers. So through digital tools, we're going to be better connecting those various stakeholders um, within the blue economy. So that is all from the lab for today. Um, but before I close, I would like to just sincerely thank SALCC for this really exciting collaboration, um, which allows us to explore the important topics of entrepreneurialism and the future of work in the Eastern Caribbean blue economy. So, so thank you, Brent, for leading that. And um, over now to Antonio Hollingsworth to start the first module for today as a part of this three-part workshop series. Good morning to you all. Just making sure everyone can hear me. Yes, okay. I can hear you well. And so, I have to, pull up. so Jordana will be assisting me this morning in the slides to so make sure that the bandwidth work, everything flows nicely. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is S. Antonio Hollingsworth. I am the founder and the executive director of Beijing Digital Creations Inc. That is a startup out of Barbados. We focus on emerging technology and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking at module one, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the blue economy and the future of, of work in the blue economy for the Caribbean. A little bit about our BlueBot project. Next slide, Jordana. All right, so we're looking at the objectives this morning. So this morning's objective is to increase awareness and familiarity with the machine learning and uh, automation in order to prepare Caribbean nation, Caribbean national, sorry, for the future of work in the Caribbean blue economy. Automation, I know, is something that is going to be a key word going forward in the next decade 
as we try to speed up and make things more efficient in how we collect data and how we analyze that data and how we present that data. Next slide. So when we hear of the word blue economy, and I'll go into a, a bit more detail in terms of what BlueBot does and what BlueBot is, uh, when, there are some keywords we need to look at when we come to this issue of blue economy and artificial intelligence. First of all, we have to dispel some myths. We have to look at what the blue economy means to us in our context, and also where artificial intelligence is at this current point in time. We want to demystify the whole concept of artificial intelligence. So the blue economy, according to the World Bank, is the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. Keywords being economic growth, keywords being improved livelihoods, keywords being preserving health. How do we give growth how do we look out for our livelihoods while preserving the health of the ecosystem? This has a wide range of uh, challenges that we face from sustainable management of marine resources to climate change to development on land. How do these things all interact within this blue economy? And in terms of artificial intelligence, simply put, the artificial intelligence that we're going to be talking about is any software or machine or process that mimics humans, human intelligence. Keyword being mimics. Uh, so I want to dispel some things about artificial intelligence, which we'll look at as we go into what AI is and what AI is not. So a little bit about us in terms of what exactly the BlueBot project is about. Uh, before Jordana plays the next slide, which is a video, hopefully it will run, it will run perfectly well. Uh, so Jordana, you're going to the next slide. making sure that I'm still visible. Oh, the, yep. the slide, yeah, the slide before that, uh, the one with the video. All right. Uh, so before we look through the video, a little bit about uh, BlueBot and what we're about. Uh, we utilize robotic technology to be able to collect visual data from the reef. And then we initially utilize that visual data to create a data set of images for use for Caribbean developers, uh, to help in their training for AI, sorry, artificial intelligence applications and algorithms. That's what we do. So it's computer vision data that we're collecting. Now, when we started off this project, we did not have a lot of data to, to work with. And we recognized that in the Caribbean, collecting underwater data was a challenge. Robotics allowed us to do that. And the AI with artificial intelligence within the robot and also the artificial intelligence that we had to write, which we'll talk about later, allowed us to be able to collect that data and analyze that data much faster than we would normally do. Uh, we entered the Blue Flame Challenge in January, 2020, thereabouts. And when we started the project, we started the project with an intention to just collect the images and created data set. However, COVID-19 posed a very interesting challenge for us. Uh, and because of the lockdowns, we had to take a different approach. And in doing so, we had to create our own algorithm to be able to identify fish in a video. In doing that, we discovered some trends in the data uh, that was purely a case of, of statistical um, recognition. And we utilized those changes to build our custom AI, which we'll, you'll hear me talk about later on, Scylla. Uh, Scylla named after the mythical beast from the Odyssey that had like, different heads that would come down and pick out the, pick out the, so, the soldiers off of Odysseus' ship. Uh, in the same way, Scylla does the same thing, except that it's not looking for, it's not looking for uh, fishermen, it's looking for fish different fish species within the particular data, I'll select them out and identify them. So we built Scylla uh, from, the, from the data sets that we collected. And from that, we've been re realizing certain trends that are turning up on the coral reef that we wouldn't have noticed if we were doing a human-based a human -based approach. So at this point, uh, Jordana will play the video. Uh, and this video gives a, a summary of 
what I just said, but with some more details of uh, the images that we've collected and also some video from underwater Barbados. Yes, just before I do, Brent, I just want to confirm that the recording is occurring. Yeah, okay, great. All right. Uh, here we So the images that we that you see here, these images were collected by robots. So this is a robot's point of view. Underwater. Right. Right, so Do you want me to, to pause while you explain? No, you can go ahead and play. This is in the wild footage. So this is a robot collecting the information. And this information that we've collected is videos uh form part of the open data sets that we have uh on Kaggle so we created the data sets as I mentioned earlier to ensure that everyone within the Caribbean had a marine data set that they can utilize to train their algorithms to do whatever they wanted it to do and later on in the in the module we'll be working on an exercise to see what information we can collect from data sets you actually get to explore a data set Okay, next slide, Jordana. Antonio, do you maybe want to just touch on just a, a couple of points that you were sharing? Um, because the, the audio may have been mixed between the video and, and what you were relaying. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Yeah, so the videos that we that you just saw, those clips came from Bluebot. They were collected by the robot. Uh, what you've seen is the robot's point of view. Uh, I am navigating the robot uh, from shoreline or from boat. Uh, but the, the robot contains an artificial intelligence that allows it to be easily controlled in the water and also to adjust the lighting and the, the image focus. So that even if you are not, if you are not trained as a PADI, a PADI certified diver or you're not necessarily trained as an underwater filmographer, you are still able to collect data because the AI does the heavy lifting for you. Next slide. So to access our data set, uh, you can do it via the link uh, that is provided in this module, or you can access the data sets via the Bluebot Projects webpage. Uh, there's a link on this page once you download the, uh, the content. So it's www.bluebotproject.com. And on that page, you will find, uh, you will find the a summary of what we do of what we did what we do sorry and you'll also find one of our ai agents that is there to assist you uh in finding the data sets uh so you can explore with that it is mobile compatible so you can get the data sets and you'll work on that the data sets as you want uh this is the image of me holding sarah or robot we have two one sarah one jesse so we don't have to be calling it robot one and robot two my daughter named them, so she, I'm happy about that. Uh, so Sarah, uh, well, Jesse uh, went out in some, in shakedown procedures number, number one, uh, in that we were new in the area and we were the first people to deploy these robots into the, in the Caribbean. So it was a bit of a learning curve for us in terms of how do we navigate currents? How do we navigate waves? How do we navigate uh, sand and collisions? So Jesse gave up the ghost so that Sarah would be able to be able to, to collect the information straight away. But now we know how to collect that information. And the learning curve is a lot shorter and the learning time is a lot sh shorter as well. Antonio, I just wanted to share one um, question from the chat um, asking, did you make this robot? How does it differ from, from an underwater drone? 
Uh, do you remember right. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll clarify that. Uh, we use the term robot as opposed to, to drone uh, because even though they're somewhat interchangeable these days, uh, because of the negative connotations with the word drone, uh, people hear drone, they think uh, aircraft, uh, via, air, air, an air vehicle. Uh, or when they hear drone, they may think of um, something that is fully automated. And we don't necessarily want that to open a floodgate that will create a whole bunch of, of problems in the negative press. Uh, in, that's because this is new. So the aerial drones that existed before, they would have had all of their marketing and such like. So we utilize the word robot here. Uh, strictly speaking, it is a robot because it's not going to be, um, there is some level of autonomy in it, uh, but you could interchange robot and drone. There are some models that exist where they actually have arms that can control and pick up stuff, uh, which would put them more in the robotic category as opposed to a flat out traditional drone. But we prefer to use the word robot to avoid the negative press. I hope that clarifies the, the issues in that regard. Uh, what you can do is hold the questions until uh, the end of the presentation so that we can go through the presentation and we can also get the questions filled in because some of the questions will be answered as we go on. Everyone clear? Yes, and I'll just encourage all those who are on the call, all the participants to keep utilizing the Q&A function and then at the end we'll respond to your questions. Uh, we'll go through the questions. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what we'll do. All right, uh, next slide, Jordana. So here we have uh, Sarah, a robot. Uh, this is how, these are the tools that we're utilizing when we're on land. Uh, we have a tether. I'll talk about why we have a tether as opposed to wireless. We have our control system and our control system is a mobile device. So we chose a robotic option that was able to be mobile compatible. Uh, the mobile device also comes with a VR capability. So I can control the robot and get the point of view in a full immersive environment, which makes it easier for control. Uh, why we went with a tether option? Well, first of all, wireless underwater is very difficult, uh, if not impossible, for, for now. Uh, however, uh, with a tether, we're able to get better control and maintain low latency. Also, a tether prevents our robot from getting stuck, which is a big deal because we want to protect the reef. So the last thing we want is to add to the plastic or add to the lithium ion batteries that are in the water. So the tether is there for control and also for retrieval. Uh, at current, our depth ceiling is 200 feet. Uh, we understand that this technology has implications when it comes to national security. So normally we do not give out the full depth of the, the depth ceiling of the robot, but it can go a little deeper than 200 feet. Uh, this is, again, because we recognize the technology and the legal implications of that technology uh, are not necessarily congruent in the Caribbean. So we have to look forward and say, okay, if we're going to be deploying these robots to collect more data, uh, we may not be the ones alone that is deploying this ro that are deploying the robots. If there are other people deploying the robots, what protocols and what policies will we need to put in place in order to have a, the safe operation of these robots in the water collecting data. Some of the things that we have to look at in terms of collecting data is what data you're collecting, uh, where you're operating. Of course, privacy is going to be an issue. Uh, safety is going to be an issue. Uh, robots underwater are unseen. So there's some level of quote unquote stealth with the robot, but you have to take into account how is that going to map itself out as more people collect this information. So we have a few policies that we've put in place uh, in terms of our protocols. One, we do not deploy robots within a swimming area because of the tether being a, a drowning hazard. Two, we do not re deploy robots within boats uh, without permission, obviously because of the privacy issues. And three, we do not deploy robots within two kilometers of a, an active port or within five kilometers of a military installation. Obviously, because of the stealth nature of the robot, the fact that it's unseen, uh, we wouldn't want to violate or encourage anyone to violate national security, which is why we put those policies in place. Uh, those policies are policies that we put in place as a company. Uh, we didn't have them imposed on us. We placed those, those policies in place because we want to ensure 
that as we move out, move this technology out into uh, the wider public, that, that this technology is being utilized responsibly. So that's why we use the word robot as opposed to drone, so that we avoid the negative press that comes with the drone and, and violations that would have occurred, especially in Barbados, where drone technology is technically illegal at this point in time. Uh, okay, next slide, Jordana. Would you like me just to quickly play this video? Oh, yes, go ahead, yeah. So here is uh, one case of where the, the robots being deployed. Uh, I must thank uh, Nicola for assisting me in recording this one. Uh, this was a deploy that occurred in June, about three months after the volcanic ash. We used the robot to collect in data uh, after the volcanic ash, uh, before divers could get into the water. This was great because the robots allow us to operate in low visibility environments uh, and areas which is, where it is unsafe for divers to be in the water. Okay, Jordana, you can play the video. So here, you'll notice how stable the robot is. Uh, that's the artificial intelligence that is dealing with the leveling and also dealing with the lighting. I'm navigating the direction. So this is a commercial robot. Uh, this is available uh, internationally. Uh, we have a, an arrangement with the manufacturers and that allows us to be able to get the latest models within, within a good time frame. Next slide. So uh, when we use the word artificial, well, when we use the word artificial intelligence, the first thing that comes to mind uh, in, in other in persons listening is Terminator, HAL, um, sci-fi. So you're thinking that this is a system that is going to be thinking just like a human being that can replace a human being that is malevolent, that might be mysterious, that might be evil, that might be good, that might be benevolent. But more often than not, when persons hear the word artificial intelligence, what they're thinking about is something from sci-fi. They're more likely thinking about artificial general intelligence, which at this point in time doesn't really exist, or they're thinking about artificial super intelligence, which does not exist and is theoretical at this point in time. The artificial intelligence that we use today uh, in general, even the most advanced AI that we, sorry, artificial intelligence that we use uh, is considered to be narrow artificial intelligence. That is to say that it is good at doing one thing or one particular task really, really well, but you can't just take one, take it from one environment and put it in another environment and expect it to fulfill the role that a human being would do. So in that case, uh, we are still irreplaceable at this point in time in some sectors, keyword being in some sectors at some tasks. So for example, would we utilize the robots and AI to replace divers in general? No, we would not use the robots to replace divers in general because there are things that a diver can do that the AI would have to be specifically trained to do. For example, our artificial intelligence scylla is good at detecting particular species, but if it comes across a species that it does not know, it cannot classify that species, it cannot name that species, it cannot define that species. That is beyond the scope of its capacity. Uh, that's where a human and a marine biologist will come into play. So the robotic technology and the artificial intelligence is not, I repeat, it is not to replace divers and marine biologists and uh, and ocean engineers. It's not to do that. It is a tool, a very smart tool, but it is a tool nonetheless. So when we go into the term artificial intelligence, getting my slides up here. Right. So when we look at the term artificial intelligence, it's a really, really wide field. So as I mentioned earlier in our terminology, Artificial intelligence is, oh, sorry, go back a bit. As mentioned in our terminology, artificial intelligence is any software process machine that mimics, sorry about that, that mimics human behavior. So that's a really wide field. 
that's anything from a simple if then else. So let's say I wanted to classify a fish. I might say, okay, if the fish is 10 centimeters long, then this fish is to be, is to be harvested. If it is not, we let it go. That is a simple decision-making process. That could be placed into a program where the program will look at the fish, measure the fish and say, okay, this fish is 10 centimeters long. It goes into harvest. This fish is not 10 centimeters long. It stays put. That's simple, basic, a basic form of algorithm. That could be classified in the AI section. Also, they may, you may have a situation where you may have a whole set of data and you may utilize that data to generate the step. So that's where machine learning comes into play. So artificial intelligence is a really wide field. You can have a case of where it is hard coded to mimic a particular behavior, or you can have the machine learning field where it is taking the data and then learning and detecting patterns from the data. So let's look at the same situation with the fish. I can hard code the if then else statement of the fish being 10 centimeters, or I could collect a whole set of data on fish and the fact that these types of fish, this size fish is, is harvestable and this size fish is not, and or the fish that we collect and the fish that we let go, and that the algorithm determine from that information which fish we allow and which fish we, we let go based on data. One is rigid, the other one is a little more flexible because obviously we will not be exactly measuring 10 centimeter fish. There may be some tolerance within there, nine centimeters uh, up to 11 centimeters. And that's where machine learning comes into play. It gives you more flexibility in the, digi in the digitalization of the blue economy. So what exactly is machine learning? What's the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence is the entire field of the decision-making process that mimics the human choice. Machine learning is the process by which we can get the artificial intelligence from data. So that's either a case of where we're looking at something like a clustering algorithm, where you're going to be taking the information and looking to see what groups exist, or it may be an image classification algorithm, which you are accustomed to, where we take a photo and that photo identifies where the, what the photo is about. So whether the photo contains a parrot fish or the photo contains a lionfish, uh, or it may be a case of where we're taking that information and we want to know where the fish is in the image. Uh, which would be object detection and such like. This is technology that we are accustomed to working with, uh, even though we may not classify it under the AI option, uh, in our mobile devices. When we take a photo and we identify a face, when we use facial recognition to unlock our phone, these are algorithms that are, they utilize machine learning to be able to solve our problems. But again, they're really good at unique tasks. So a program that's good at recognizing faces may not be good at recognizing fish. And fish are very hard to recognize. Uh, and within the machine learning uh, category, there is this special field of deep learning, which utilizes a particular art, art architecture called neural networks. And these neural networks are in a sense, uh, in, in the simplest version, they're mathematical functions that take your data and learn from that data. Uh, this is the easiest field to get into in terms of deep learning, in, in terms of machine learning and artificial intelligence, because it literally is drag and drop these days. Uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft all have no code or working on no code options where you are allowed to put in the data and deep learning will look through the data and gather the insight and gather the pattern that exists within the data in order for you to build a model. So if you're looking to jump into the world of um, artificial intelligence and develop algorithms, deep learning may be the best, for you, the best place for you to start. Uh, we'll look at that later on in the, in the question, of, question and, uh, and answer section. So a quick recap, artificial intelligence is a broad field. It's any process or any software or any uh, mechanical system that is going to mimic a human behavior. That's it, that's a pretty low bar. And then out of that, you have machine learning, which is a part of artificial intelligence. So you're learning from the data that you've collected. So data first, then the model is generated as opposed to model first to generate the data. And then we have deep learning, which is a special form of machine learning 
which utilizes neural networks. And you can look at a neural network as kind of like a, a brain, sort of, where each neuron is uh, well, what we call a perceptron within the neural network. And there are many types of deep neural networks uh, that exist, but those are beyond the scope of this current uh, workshop. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, today's artificial intelligence is pretty narrow. Uh, it's good at doing particular tasks and the tasks generally fall under uh, three main groups. Uh, it's either going to be natural language processing and natural language understanding, uh, which would be your chat box. That would be your, uh, your series, your Alexas. Um, on our page, we have uh, Hiaro. Hiaro is our chat bot. Uh, that chat bot's fully AI. Uh, it will be able to understand what you said and be able to fulfill it based on what we have allowed it to be able to do. So in our specific case, uh, Hiaro is utilized for assisting you in getting data sets. It's unique to Beijing Digital Creations Inc. It will give you information about the company and it will allow you to interact with me via telephone or by WhatsApp. That's what it's trained to do. Uh, it's not trained to learn key phrases. It's going to take what you put in and try to figure out what, you're, what you mean by that. That's how narrow it is. So if you ask Yaro about uh, what kind of dog is a Doberman Pinsker, uh, Yaro won't know anything about a dog because it's not, uh, it doesn't have access to the entire network, the entire internet. Uh, you may have more advanced programs like um, Siri and Alexa and such like that may have access to the entire internet, but I'm sure that if you ask them about the nuts and bolts of what Beijing Digital Creations Inc. does or anything about the Blue Box project, they won't know. And the reason why they won't know is because, again, uh, they aren't artificial general intelligence. They don't have the ability to go out, look at something that is totally new and explore it and see what's going on and then relate that information within context. They do not have that ability human beings have that ability. So what I'd like you to do as we go forward is to understand that when I use the term artificial intelligence, we are not talking about the sci-fi situation. We're living in the real world and in the real world, artificial intelligence is a tool like fire. One caveat, fire is a tool that can be used to bring good or it's a tool that can be used to bring destruction. Fire in itself is neutral. The user and wielder of the fire is the person that we need to be concerned about. So what I would like us in the Caribbean to start looking at is the beneficial applications of artificial intelligence. Instead of sitting on the sidelines and saying, okay, AI is bad, full stop. Uh, look at where the application of artificial intelligence can be used to benefit us. In this case, in the case of natural language processing and natural language understanding, we trained an artificial intelligence to be able to give information quickly about what we're doing. So you don't have to wait for a human being to respond to you at some other time, which allows us to be able to give data 24 hours a day, no matter the time zone. We utilize artificial intelligence in terms of computer vision. So uh, Sarah will collect the information and Scylla will go through that information and analyze that visual data in order to give us information about the fish, uh, fish species, uh, who is there in relation to what, that's the information that is there collected from Scylla, that's computer vision, very narrow task. And speech generation or uh, text-to-speech is something that we would have known uh, from our phones and from, again, Siri and Alexa and such like. And uh, we have a video in this presentation where the speech is actually generated by an artificial intelligence. It's not done by me at all. Uh, so we apply artificial intelligence to leverage our, our time, to leverage our capabilities, to leverage our capacity. Am I a marine biologist? No, I am a data scientist. But because of my ability to collect data and utilize that data uh, to learn and gain insights into the coral reef, there are certain things that we detected straight away uh, that were part of theses that persons would have worked on over the past years. But because we could process more data and collect more data, 
uh, you will see how we can leverage that to gain insight much faster. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, we're not at artificial general intelligence. This is what people mostly think about uh, when, they, when they hear the term artificial intelligence. In artificial intelligence. Uh, we are not there as yet. Will we be there within the next decade? Maybe. Doubtfully, but maybe. In the next 20 years, more likely. In the next 50 years, probably yes. Uh, but we aren't there yet. Next slide. This one is what everyone fears, artificial super intelligence. And we will not go into too much detail here because everything here is speculation. Uh, everything here is speculation, no one knows. Uh, to put it in perspective of how your understanding is going to go, think of it this way. Where we are now in terms of artificial intelligence is like, a, it's about as smart as, as an ant, capable of doing things for very narrow and specific tasks. Good tool. And together, a whole bunch of them might be able to do something amazing, but generally pretty quote unquote dumb. Uh, artificial general intelligence would be more like a child. Uh, that would be like a four, a five to seven year old that is capable of exploring and curious and wanting to know something about the world and the space around them. That's your artificial general intelligence. And you see the difference between an ant and a child. Artificial super intelligence. Uh, not to be blasphemous here at all, but it's pretty, basically to put it in context, artificial intelligence would be more like a god, a supreme being that we have absolutely no idea what they're thinking about. Uh, we would speculate about what their motives would be, or what they might do, or what they might not do, but it may be completely different. We can't really understand what it's going to look like. Uh, as such, we're not going to be discussing that at all. So we will not be mentioning things like singularities or... Uh, whether AI is evil and whether it will take over the world or whether it will kill us all. We will not be discussing anything of that sort because that's speculative. We don't know. And anyone that says, yeah, we know what's going to happen, uh, they're probably not giving you the whole story uh, because we don't know. Uh, so think of it as right now we're the general intelligence and the narrow AI will be an ant and the super intelligence will be a god. So as alien as that is from us, as, as alien as we will be uh, to it. So I will not be going into too much detail in that regard. Next slide. Right, so how can we utilize AI in the blue economy? Where is it used uh, today? Uh, so we know about uh, autopilots on ships. That's basic, uh, utilizing GPS coordinates in order to get a location fix and doing the calculations in order to set bearings, most of that done by the ship navigation computer, a form of artificial intelligence. Uh, we know of the port handling and the logistics, uh, the information goes in, how to track uh, cargo, how to track uh, a vessel, how to track uh, the information, the products that are being shipped. Uh, all of that utilizes anything from computer vision to object detection to um, machine learning logistics. Uh, so that's in your port management and your logistics and such like. Uh, even in terms of customs and immigration, uh, sorry, customs, the products that come in can be recognized by computer vision. And those, that computer vision goes towards your database, which allows you to, to charge your duties and track, your, track your, your information in terms of what comes in, what's going out of your country, what's coming into space, what's leaving a space. That's where things are right now. Uh, cybersecurity in terms of your uh, anomaly detection, that's really important. You want to protect your, your data from hackers. You want to protect your data from intruders. You want to have legitimate actors in your, in your cyberspace and legitimate actors in your, in your ship systems. So that security is something that is, it is important. Uh, can you create viruses to, to hack a system? Yes. Can you have your antivirus systems? Yes, but antivirus systems are after the fact. You want to be able to prevent people from getting into the systems themselves. And that's where your cybersecurity comes into play. Unfortunately, in the Caribbean, we do not place a lot of emphasis on cybersecurity. And that is a big downfall for us. And it is something that we really need to be mindful of as we go into the blue economy, especially 
when we are dealing with uh, AI and big data. Uh, to put it in a particular context, you can write, uh, remember what AI is, uh, there is nothing stopping anyone from utilizing AI tool to access information into anywhere. Uh, so I'll give an example of something as innocuous as putting a watermark on an image. Uh, we don't put, well, I don't put watermarks on my images at all. I don't, I no longer put watermarks in uh, because there are algorithms that can remove the watermark very easily. Uh, and it's not really a very complicated algorithm either. So that's a case of where artificial intelligence is being used to violate copyright in, in some regard. Um, also, we are aware of deep fakes that exist right now, uh, where you're utilizing artificial intelligence to create videos that are, are not real or not authentic. So what's happening there is that you're starting to create data that is not authentic and that is problematic. So when we're looking at cybersecurity in the blue economy, we want to be able to ensure that you're not going to be doing stuff that would create problems. You don't want to create a situation where you have a ship data that's showing that there's a fault in a part that doesn't exist, or there is uh, somewhere that is uh, under threat that is not under threat and you have doors open and such like. So cybersecurity is a big issue that, is, that exists in the blue economy that we need to address very much. Uh, and the last part, computer vision and text-to-speech. This one is uh, what we're using right now. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, computer vision turns up in port management. Uh, computer vision can also turn up in fish detection. Uh, computer vision is looked at in a few emerging technologies when it comes to the blue economy, especially in fish identification and also in uh, fish classification for market values and to get better prices. Uh, so this video that we have here, where AI converts video data to numerical data, uh, this is, thanks Jordana, you can play that if it, if it plays well. It's from YouTube. All right, so this is what we did uh, earlier. You know, we utilized the robot to collect the image data, and then we wrote Scylla to be able to analyze that image data and generate numerical data so the graph that you're seeing in the, in the video, that graph is the interpretation of all of that reef data that is put together with, by the artificial, by, the, by, by Scylla. Uh, to give you some context of how much data we're looking at, uh, that graph that you're seeing consists of around 30,000, thereabouts, around 30,000 data points. So that's 30,000 data points. Uh, there is no way that myself or my partner in terms of uh, business could be able to go through that in that information uh quickly no way no way how uh and that's taken over an 11 month period where we were able to deploy a robot at different sample points and then based on that develop uh, a pattern or for the reef so we've seen we're seeing how these particular species interact on this particular reef and no two reefs apparently are the same. Each one has a particular fingerprint. We didn't know this going in. Uh, we just went to collect the information. But because of, again, the simple AI that we, we worked on, uh, we were able to develop and recognize that each reef or each section of the reef has a particular fingerprint, which is what we're working on right now. Next slide. So where we are in terms of tomorrow. Uh, so you've seen the videos before, uh, and most of the stuff that is here is what we're working on or what we're looking at or where the trend is looking uh, in, the, in the world uh, tomorrow, so the blue economy. Uh, one of the big things in, in the blue economy right now uh, is environmental management. Uh, big deal, a very big deal. Uh, however, you can only manage what you can measure. And if measurement is very difficult or collecting data is very hard, then it makes the management process even more complicated. And as the management, as measurement process and collecting that data becomes more complicated, there's a tendency to, for you to just not do it. The effort to collect the data is just too much. And you may want to do it, it would be nice to protect the reef, but it's just too much data to collect. And uh, we want to be able to look at reducing the friction and reducing the, the time and the resources uh, and the human capital that is required to collect this information so that we are able to process it and get the data that we need 
to manage the environment that we have. Yes, we want to do coral reef restoration. Yes, we want to preserve the reef, but what exactly does a healthy reef look like? Do we have the data that met that allows us to say, this is what a reef looks like that is healthy, uh, and then utilize that as a blueprint to be able to go forward in our conservation processes? Do we know what a well-managed reef looks like? How do we define that? These are things that require data, and at current, we don't have enough data in general. Uh, and that's where we want to fill in the gaps in terms of your environmental management. Speaking about data, uh, we're going to be looking at that workshop tomorrow. Look at data tomorrow in our workshop. Uh, what exactly do we mean by data in the blue economy? Uh, it may not necessarily be what you are thinking. It may be exactly what you're thinking, but with added with a different slant. Uh, accessibility is a big deal. Uh, we have populations that are aging, and they must be able to interact with the, the coral reefs. We have people who are differently able. We have people who are neurodiverse. They must be able to interact with coral reefs. That's their heritage. That's our heritage as a, as a Caribbean people. So how are we going to allow the average person to be able to interact with this heritage before climate change or any other catastrophe uh, destroys it uh, and it's gone forever? Uh, one of the things that we are realizing is how many people within Barbados uh, in the Barbadian context do not have access to or have never seen this video or seen in reality what you're seeing on the screen. They don't believe that that is Barbados. It's too beautiful. They haven't seen that part of Barbados at all. Uh, they you just see the surface. And being able to experience the life underwater is something that is extremely um, life-changing. Uh, we've had a few people who interact with the robots and they were happy to be able to do that. Uh, because they, they got to see a world that they would never see unless they learned how to swim or how to dive or how to, how to snorkel. And I'm realizing how many persons not, are not able to do that, even though we live on an island. Also, in terms of the looking forward in the future, uh, in terms of measuring, you'll see at the bottom we have anal analytics and insight. And this is something that's a big deal uh, and something I hold dearly to my heart. A lot of the information that exists in terms of data collection is a case of where you, sometimes you're eyeballing it. You, you dive, you say, okay, how many fish are on the reef? You give an estimate. It's kind of difficult for human beings to count fish unless you're trained, uh, and even so, to count them accurately. Uh, we, re <laughs> we realize that in that the fish move very quickly. So there are some cases where we're looking at the video and a fish comes into screen and then goes out the screen and we don't register it until we actually look at the video like three or four times. Our brains aren't designed to process information like that. However, with uh, artificial intelligence, we're able to process uh, our image data much faster. So 30 frames per second is what we're recording at, and the, artificial, the AI can go through the frames much faster than we can. And there are some cases where we actually identify some species and they took up around three frames in the data set, three frames in the data set. They're moving that quickly uh, relative to the robot. We, there's no way we would be able to pick that up before 25, per frame, uh, 25 frames per second vision uh, that we are utilizing. So AI allows us to be able to generate analytics and insights that we would not normally have because we are able to process way more information. So this graph is which you're going to look at tomorrow's workshop, uh, this graph is generated by our artificial intelligence, Scylla, uh, after viewing reef data from one location. The next slide. Right, so what do you need to do in order to get into this field of machine learning and artificial intelligence? Do you have to be a super coder? And do you have to go and get a degree? Do you have to do all these things? And the answer to all of that is no and yes. No in that a lot of large technology companies are recognizing that people want to get into the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but they don't necessarily have the data science background in order to do it. Uh, and companies may want to utilize artificial intelligence, but they don't, they can't afford to have a data scientist on the, on the payroll. Uh, 
our company is an example of, of that. Now, I happen to be working as in, in the capacity as a data scientist, so I'm able to collect the data, analyze the data, process the data, and write the algorithm. I'm able to do that. But if I had to outsource this information, it would be a, a completely different ballgame in terms of cost, because I'd have to get my data, I have to send my data out, I have to clean my data, I have to store my data, I have to get that data into the, get the model designed, find the model that is best fit, et cetera, et cetera. It's a process and a workflow that is particularly interesting. It took me a while to do when I've been doing this for, from before, like a year before uh, 2020. Uh, so if you want to get into this field, there are some things that you should be well versed in. Uh, first of all, you're looking at, we're looking at statistics. Uh, linear algebra is important. So being able to read the functions and uh, work with the math is important uh, to understand the papers and to read through the paper. That's important. Being able to code is also important, but being able to look at a data set and look at data and process it utilizing statistical way measures to look at data and see how um, that data relates to other data to see whether that data is biased in a particular area or uh, whether it's skewed in a particular view whether the data is representative of what you're looking at. Those are skills that are extremely important if you're going to be going into the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence. The old adage of garbage in, garbage out is extremely important. And I'm gonna give you an example of how you can bias your data set. So uh, in training Scylla, I'm looking at it in context of Scylla because the other example is a little too hot, to hot topic to look at. Um, but I'll mention it to show you how AI can go awry if you don't have a proper grasp of the data. So we were training the algorithm to be able to identify one particular species. And uh, what I did not know or didn't recognize as we went through the data, because there's so much, is that this particular species love to be under rocks. They, in all of the data, they love to be under rocks. That's, that's what it do, do to hide. So we collect the image data, we identify the species, we, put, we create the data set, and we set our model to train. So the model went through all the data and it learned, not fish, rocks. Because everywhere the species was, there was a rock that was common in data. So the data set was biased towards rocks. And we didn't recognize that the, so we have our data set, it's going well, it's learning and high accuracy. And then we deploy that data set into the, the problem, and rec that model, sorry, into the problem and recognize that our model hasn't learned how to identify species at all, or species A at all. That model has learned how to identify rocks. So it's really good at finding rocks, which would work normally if we had trained it to, or we wanted it to learn rocks, but we didn't want it to learn rocks and it biased the entire model. And we had to change the entire model and do some redesigning. It took me about three months to recognize that there was a bias in the data because there's so much data that we're going through. And yes, the model is getting it correct, but when you go through the benchmarking, you're realizing, okay, this is getting these things wrong. So benchmarking is like making sure the model, think of it as a teacher. So the model is the student, I'm the teacher, I give it a test, Benchmarking is me going, to through, going through to say, okay, okay, model, what have you learned? How well are you doing on this test? And in some cases, it was doing horribly on the test because the data was biased. Now we know how to correlate that data to avoid data bias. That's something that we spend a lot more time on and a lot more focus on because we don't have to spend a lot of time developing the models. They're out of the box models that you can download and you can work with to train them based on your data. But if your data is rubbish, then your model will be rubbish as well. So think of it as garbage in, garbage out. Now, saying that places the emphasis on data, your data collection is extremely important because any biases that exist in your data are going to be transferred to your model. And the biases that exist in your data, you may not even be thinking about. And the example with the rocks is a, is a good example of that. We collected legit data uh, of species in their natural form doing what they do best. 
And from that, the model learned a particular bias. And we had to tweak our data to balance out the data set. So that's where uh, data gathering and storage is a really important skill. And that's why I put that as number one. The other two statistical inferences and linear algebra are great, but the ability to collect proper data is the most important thing that is there, especially where you have a data, where, where you have a shortage of data. That's extremely important. Uh, languages that you need to learn in terms of coding, if you want to do coding, would be Python, R, uh, SQL, and Go. Uh, Python is the most popular framework. There are lots of YouTube uh, tutorials, lots of tutorials online, lots of documentation on Python and machine learning and, and AI mo and artificial intelligence models. Uh, in terms of machine learning frameworks, you have lots of documentation on TensorFlow and PyTorch and OpenCV and Keras. These are the main uh, libraries that are being used in uh, machine learning. Uh, you can download a model from TensorFlow and as the arch as base architecture, and you can train that model to do something else without having to go through all of the, the details of art artificial intelligence architecture and uh, artificial intelligence engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Also, if you may not want to create your own model, but you have something that is a general case, like maybe image classification or object detection, uh, you want to recognize faces and such like, then you have cloud services that you can use. So you have Google Cloud Platform, which gives you AI tools that you can utilize. So you can pay to have those, those, AI, those artificial intelligence tools to be working on your data. So you can offer that. Uh, it's going to be a cloud service. So it's pay as you can pay per computation. Uh, so the idea is to work with your models to make sure that they're as, as efficient as possible. Uh, Microsoft Azure allows you to do the same thing. Uh, and Amazon's working on a, a no code situation as well. So even if you don't have the quote unquote coding background uh, to develop the algorithms on your own, uh, once you are able to collect good data, that good data that you've collected can be utilized to train a model pretty easily. The keyword being collecting your good data. And that's why I'm spending a lot of time focusing on that. Uh, in terms of in terms of the blue economy, because we need to be able to collect good data. We can only manage what we can measure. And if we can't measure it properly, then our management policies are going to be um, a problem. And given the risk of risk collapse in our, it, the risk that risk collapse poses to our economies, uh, we do not have the time and we do not have the, 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 the wiggle room to be making uh, errors because of incomplete data or uh, bad data. Next slide. So uh, right on cue, we have our exercise. So in this exercise, you'll be looking at a data set. Uh, so the video shows you what you're going to be doing. You're going to examine the data set if you have downloaded the if you've downloaded the presentation or opened the presentation, you can click on the link to get the data set. Uh, if you haven't, uh, I'll place the link in the chat so you can access the link to go to a data set and be looking through the data set that is there. Uh, so the data set is, I don't know if Jordana, you can open the data set. So click on, click on the click to get data set. That was yeah, I'm just adding it to the chat now. Um, so all participants should be able to access this, this data set that Antonio is referencing. Uh, excellent, lovely. So uh, what I'm going to uh, allow you to do right now, uh, enough of me talking, uh, you're going to get to be data scientists for a little bit uh, where you're going to be examining our data set. This data set is a public data set. It's uh, published. Uh, it consists of around a little over 2,000 uh, images. Uh, you're not going through all 2000 uh, unless you can get through them pretty quickly. What you're doing is you're looking at the data set and yes, the data set is on part fish. That's obvious. Uh, but I would like you to be able to look at that image data and see what else, what other data uh, might be useful that is in the data set. This is to get you thinking uh, 
a little different, thinking differently when it looks when, when it comes to visual data. So we go out, we can look at a video and we just see a video. Great, excellent, lovely. You're looking at a video of me right now. But within that video is a whole bunch of other information. It's uh, where I am, it's uh, my eyes, uh, it's data on my, my facial features, it's data about uh, my bio data. The same thing exists in the fish in the case of the, the data set with the parrotfish. There are many types of parrotfish that are there, one. And also there's other information. I don't wanna spill the beans as the other information that you might want to be looking for, but I'll give you about 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes to go through the data sets and uh, explore and see what is there. You can place what you're, what, you're, what you're found or what you think should be there or think is the data that is there uh, within the chat. And uh, you can be as creative as you, as you would like. Okay? So I'll be pointing out. Yeah. I think we should um, maybe just keep it to, to, you want to do 10 minutes or, or less than that? 10 minutes, 10 minutes will work. Okay. Yeah. All right, everyone. Um, I noticed as well, when you click on the data set, you just have to scroll down to the file that says pair of fish um, with 1,285 files, and then that will take you um, to the open data set, just in case anyone is, is having trouble accessing it. Um, but okay, I'm, I'm looking at the time and keeping it, so uh, we'll do this exercise for 10 minutes. And if there are any questions, please add them to the chat. If you can't add to the chat, um, just type them into the Q&A. All right, uh, so you can place your questions in. So while you're looking at your data set, I'll be going through the questions and uh, getting to see which ones we answer in the, in, the part, in the order. So I'll be grouping questions together now. So I'm looking at the questions in the uh, in the in the chat. These are some really good questions that you've asked. So we'll clarify that as we go on. These are some really good questions.
Nice. So I'm looking at some of the responses. I'm looking at the questions. I'm seeing some really good responses turn up in the chat. Uh, yes, there are things that we actually look, we're actually looking at and creating a data set from that, yeah. Uh, so I've seen here things like differences. Let's see, I've seen here. Someone picked out uh, sex in the, of the parrot fish, yeah. The distribution of, of the different sexes, yeah. There's a nice one from Ryan. Uh, the majority of the fish were female. You are correct. Uh, the majority of the fish were female. That's a good insight that you picked up. The reason, there's a reason why the majority of the fish were female. And that turn, that's actually how we ended up um, creating Scylla. Uh, we recognized that there were things turning up in the data. Remember, this is just a data set of power fish images. But from that data set of parfish images, we recognize that there was other data encoded in the information. And you're beginning to see that data that's being encoded into, into a single data set. So yes, most of the parfish were females. Uh, that, was a, that was exactly the problem uh, that was turning up uh, in that most of the fish were being uh, harvested before reaching terminal stage. Uh, so yeah, the differences in color uh, does show where they are in maturity and uh, that does turn up in the data set. Yeah, you're correct. Okay, Antonio, we're pretty much at time now for this exercise. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are a few others that were noted. Yeah, uh, I'm also seeing uh, things in terms of the coral and the sea bottom. Yes, that is something that is there. Turbidity data, that's something that you can extract as well. Uh, sizes you can extract as well, different species you can extract as well uh, from that data. So what I want you to uh, take away as we look at data tomorrow uh, is that even from a simple case of collecting an image uh, of a part fish from video gives you a rich amount of data in that you're able to see uh, the distribution of male and female in this part, in a particular data set. In this case, the data set is pretty wide, but let's, uh, if we were taking the data from a single location or a single reef, utilizing the robot, then we'd be able to collect that information and say, okay, on this reef, we have lots of parrot fish. On this reef, we have a little bit of parrot fish. Uh, we have good, a good breeding stock because we have lots of males and females that are able to, to reproduce or at reproductive stage, uh, or we don't. We have overpopulation, sorry, we have uh, overfishing occurring and we're extracting them before they reach terminal phase. All that information is coming out from a simple video. And that's what we mean by utilizing AI in the artificial intelligence in the blue economy to be able to manage. If we try to do this uh, by audit, it would probably take a while. Uh, but we were able to collect this information pretty quickly. Uh, I want to answer a few questions. Uh, I want to answer a few questions that came up in the question and answer before we move on to the next part. Uh, the next part with the discussion is something for you to think about. Uh, we can pick that up uh, at a later date. Uh, so some questions that came up, uh, one of the questions that was there was concerning AI neutrality. Uh, and uh, that was from uh, Mr. Frontin Bryan. Uh, if we were going to, or if we're looking at uh, contemplating AI governance, frame, governance framework, you made a very good point. You don't have to reach singularity or have artificial general intelligence for AI to go very bad. Uh, you can simply be making mistakes or introduce a bias that can lead to problems. You're absolutely correct on that. So there needs to be some level of accountability in terms of your artificial intelligence. Totally agree there. Uh, we have some policies that we have in, in, in house in terms, of our in terms of our data. So while the artificial intelligence is there to assist us, it is a tool to assist humans. It does not replace a human being. Uh, that said, even in terms of our assistant in terms uh, in, 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 in Hiaro, 
the chatbot, the general information that is there, it'll give that general information. It's designed to do that. It is not designed to score and collect or pick out information at random because, as I mentioned earlier, information without context is dangerous. So we have in hand our policy in house that a human has the final say. The machine is just a tool. Should the state have AI government rule, uh, artificial intelligence uh, governance rules, frameworks, or legislation? At this stage, I would say no, uh, because uh, I'm looking at the at the drone situation. Uh, aerial drones are powerful technology that allow us to be able to look at uh, uh, monitoring uh, crops, to monitoring fields, but it was misused and everything came out with a hammer and tried to make it illegal. And then we have to now reinvent, not reinvent, we have to now do some public education on how it can be used well. The other approach is to say, okay, we have this technology, let's encourage people to utilize the technology and, and highlight, the, highlight the positive uses of the technology rather than focus on the negative aspects and then try to clamp it down and control it. Uh, my concern with governments and states clamping down on, um, on artificial intelligence is because one, we do not have a lot of people in that space represented in the Caribbean. That's a big problem because when it comes to data sets, the more, the more representative you are in the data, the more likely your you are is going to be um it, you, you are you, you are going to be represented by the AI. I'll give a good example here uh there was a challenge a while back where the concern was that AI was being racist uh because it wasn't recognizing people who were colored and uh what happened basically is that the representation in the data set is sorry i apologize for noise uh representation in the data set was not as as robust we need to be represented in the data. And the only way to do that is to have at this stage, the freedom to go out and, and explore uh, rather than have this limited case of only a particular few and with particular credentials and a particular space to do a particular thing. Uh, that's not what we want in the Caribbean. So we need the freedom that is there. I don't think that state reg legislation or state regularization uh, is the way forward in that regard. Right. Uh, I consider myself more an artist than a, than a, a, a technician. And just as you wouldn't want to censor art, I don't think that you should censor the creativity in this space yet. Uh, we're too early in that regard. And, right. Antonio, just um, I'm just noting I have unmuted Frontem Brian's mic just in case um, yeah. you would like to add anything more. I know the times so we don't have too much to devote to this, um, but uh, not sure if you're, if it's Brian or if it's Frontem, but please um, go ahead and add some more if you would like to. Thanks, Joanna. It's Brian, um, and thanks, for Antonio. I really appreciate the context and this wider conversation. So I just want to quickly say that. Um, if you know, and, and I'm sure we all know it, but but working within a Caribbean government uh, public sector arrangement, we we've often seen them, as you said earlier, go completely in the other direction. Anytime there's something scary, and I'm talking as far back as Airbnb entering the region, trying to sign um, tax collection um, policy documents. So there's a lot of always this uh, uh, starting point of mistrust and distrust. But I think. Um, bringing them to the table to create, I, it's not even, I understand the dilemma between uh, clamping down on the possibilities, but we need them at the table. And I think the technology train is going to keep uh, moving faster and faster. Um, you have NFTs coming out, you have smart contracts on the horizon. And I think the only way to really get them, and particularly the AI conversation, is, is give, it, give it some parameters, it may not be completely legislated, but parameters in which they can feel it's a sandbox maybe within the context of them saying, okay, blue economy, only for these areas, I feel comfortable, let me liberalize or dem democratize the space. But I think we just need to uh, give to get, I think, in the long term. And when I say give, I know sometimes there's overreach on the government side, but I'm not sure if it's a complete zero government um, policy position may, may yield the, the results you're looking for as they continue to be apprehensive of new technology. But thanks for the opportunity to share. 
Yes, uh, and, and that's a good, that's a very good point that is there. Um, so you're, you're moving into the, the question of now, okay, ethical AI, a civil AI, uh, in terms of, okay, where should AI exist and where should AI not exist? You're mentioning, you mentioned some very good points. And those are discussions that are outside of the blue economy. Those are general discussions that we need to look at. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in order to have a useful conversation on that, you have to have education. And that's what these modules, these uh, workshops are for, to educate people of where we are and where we are not. So thank you for your contribution. Uh, just want to answer one question before we wrap up uh, I gener uh, quickly. Uh, the question was there in terms of, did we make the drones? No, we did not make the drones. Uh, we purchased the drones from a manufacturer out of China, uh, Yaokan kind of Robotics, and uh, we modify them to meet our environment. As mentioned earlier, uh, Jesse uh, failed in shakedown procedures, not because the product was really, was, was, wasn't good. The product's an excellent product. It's just that uh, navigating within calm water and navigating in the Atlantic is a completely different <laughs> kettle of fish. Uh, and that is something that uh, we, we had to figure out how to do. So we did some customization that is there. The customization part that we did, that's trade secret. So since we're recording, we won't go into details on that part, but it's some tweaks that we had to make in order to increase the survivability of the machines within our, within our context. Uh, that's all that is there. Uh, in terms of your data, did I notice any trends outside of the traditional ways? Yes. So there was, I have I've had the privilege of looking at a report out of, uh, in terms of a health, health report, and uh, it contains information, which is good, uh, good qualitative information, uh, but I couldn't use it for machine learning purposes because it doesn't have enough, it didn't have enough robust, the enough, data wasn't robust enough for me to utilize it as a machine learning application. So the trends that would have existed between, let's say, Sergeant Majors and uh, Krang, what we discovered is that wherever you had Sergeant Majors being fed, those are the yellow and black fish, wherever they were being fed, uh, the amount of Krang that were in that area was reduced, significantly reduced. Uh, that turned up in all the data. Before, you, we weren't even looking for that. It just turned up in the data and we observed that trend. Uh, that we were able to do, and you'll see that play itself out in tomorrow's exercise when we look at data. Um, we were able to recognize that trend because we went through, we had about 30,000 data points. We would not recognize that trend if we were doing it by, by, by eyeball. And that's the difference between the two. Uh, that's the advantage that exists uh, because we're collecting so much data and because we're analyzing data uh, in, in high volume, uh, we're able to detect trends that may not necessarily be detectable uh, in, 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 in that regard. So that's the, one of the things that we look at in terms of the, in terms of the positives of this process. Also, uh, we're able to deploy um, easily. So a general deploy time may be about an hour, thereabouts. That's an hour to go out, collect the data, come back, get the data off the machine, and then about 30 minutes to process the information uh, via Scylla. If we're building a data set, it's much faster than that. Uh, so that's the, the time, the workflow in terms of the utilization of artificial intelligence and robotics within the blue economy and the, especially in terms of risk conservation. Right, I think that's all the questions that were in the Q&A. Yes, Antonio, I, I also noted that um, Miranda George Arthur's hand was raised earlier. So Miranda, I'm just going to give you um, permission to talk. So I have unmuted you. If you would still like to add your point, it's possible that it has passed. Um, but I'll just give you a moment if you would um, like to share anything. And then otherwise, I think we have answered uh, all the excellent questions in the chat. Uh, because of the nature of the topic, what we've done is that we've created, I think Jordana has shared it in the, in the chat. Right. Uh, we did uh, create a Discord uh, channel. So those of you who are familiar with Discord, uh, we did create a Discord server where you can continue the conversation and continue the discussion uh, between workshops. Uh, the 
the rules for operation within that framework, within that, within that platform are there already. Uh, general rules, be respectful and such like. Uh, please note that again, once the workshop is completed, uh, you don't have to worry about things like IT and such like, that's why I created a Discord that is there uh, so that everyone can see what everyone is doing uh, and, has, and have done. So there's full transparency on that, on that part. Uh, any questions that you may have before we close? Sorry, um, Jordana, I don't know. I tried to type it in the chat and see what is the word. Are you able to share? Sorry, Brent, I'm having a bit of trouble hearing oh, you. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, do you have the flyer with the um, link to Thursday and, and Friday's uh, workshop? That, yes. Yeah. If, if you could please post it in the chat, and um, I'd like to encourage the participants to just share it. Yeah, thanks. Yes, I have included the link to registration for tomorrow and Friday's workshops, which are at the same time. Um, and I'll just switch to the next slide. The workshop that's tomorrow, module two, is on leveraging data in the blue economy. Uh, same time, same place, same link. And module three is on Friday on entrepreneurship in the blue economy. So if there are no other questions, uh, maybe Antonio and Brent, I can just um, wrap up with some quick closing remarks. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Antonio, and thank you to Brent. Um, I was really, Antonio, taken by your descriptions of what AI can do um, versus what humans can do, and your explanation of just how narrow AI currently is, which is new information to me. Um, and I think that's really important to note as we understand the implications of some of this, some of these technologies, uh, you know, on the Caribbean's blue economy. Um, because to me, that demonstrates that really now is the optimal time to start integrating AI and machine learning further as they continue to develop and, and take off, um, particularly for jobs and livelihoods. And as has come up today, maybe some, some governance uh, legislation as well. Um, so just in conclusion, I would like to say thank you to all those who joined today. Um, There's lots of lively discussion, excellent questions and comments, so thank you. Um, and it was really excellent to kick off this Blue Skills 4.0 workshop series as a collaboration between UNDP and SALCC um, as we continue to explore the, the future of work in the Caribbean and in the Blue economy in general. Um, so for those who are able to attend our upcoming sessions, again, there'll be two more modules occurring tomorrow and on Friday. Um, and the link is in the chat for registration for those who are able to attend. Um, so, so thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Brent. Um, any other points that you would like to add for today? You made perfect timing, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'd just like to echo some of uh, your sentiments. I'd like to thank um, those who have joined in. I would like to also thank you and your team, Jordana. Um, we're very happy about the collaboration with UNDP Accelerator Lab in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, I'd also like to thank Antonio, the star of the show. <laughs> um, very good presentation, very good information um, right there. Um, I, for one, am blown away. I'm, I'm sure the others who attended the, the session are also. And um, we, we're looking forward to the other days. So I just want to say thank you again to everyone. Thank you to UNDP. Thank you, Antonio. And um, let, let, let's, let's make some more magic tomorrow. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, so tomorrow we'll be looking at data, uh, marine data, and uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, tomorrow we're going, to be going through tomorrow's exercise. We're going to be looking at some graphs. Well, looking at air graphs and doing some more some more analysis. In, well, not too in depth, but we're looking at how valuable data is in the blue economy. Data is king. <laughs> All right, looking forward to it. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, there was a question on if this recording will be shared. I know it will for sure uh, exist on UNDP and SALCC pages. Um, so yes, it, it will be accessible. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone.